Hello, Amara. Thanks so much for joining me today and our project Speaking Truths to Youth. It's great to see you. I have a few questions I'd like to ask you, if that's okay. The first one is, what events or beliefs in your youth, and I realize I think you're still in your youth, led you to become an activist? Yeah, I look back to my childhood and I remember that um, I had a really deep curiosity for the natural world from a very early age. I would um, often sit under the oak tree and at the back of my yard and it would offer me a lot of solace. I would hear the cicadas in, in that DC is notorious for the wind against my skin and I just felt really at home in that environment. And although I had that initial curiosity, I did not have the means to be able to explore my passion further in an academic setting or in a more formal setting. And I realize now, and as a um, environmental educator, I realize that the reason why I didn't have those opportunities was because of things that I really couldn't change about myself. Those being that I grew up in a socioeconomically underserved background. Um, I'm from an immigrant community. I'm from a metropolitan area. And so all of these things made it so that it was pretty hard for me to actually access um, and build my passion for the environment. And I think that's really what made me want to pursue a career as an environmental educator, because although I didn't have such opportunities, I wanted to be able to provide opportunities for folks like myself, youth like myself, to engage in the outdoors um, so that they can have those powerful outdoor learning experiences. Could you give a couple of maybe specific examples of times when you felt like you couldn't maybe explore what your curiosity was driving you to explore? I would say that I am, um, I'm a Nigerian immigrant, so I'm from Nigeria, um, and I moved to the United States when I was about three years old. And I think that like many BIPOC folks, like many Black folks, my family had a um, kind of a fear of engaging in the outdoors because historically that has been a place that violence has been perpetuated against BIPOC folks and Black folks in particular. So, you know, I remember that there were times where, you know, I would express my desires to go outside. I would kind of be told that, you know, the outdoors is not a great place. It's not a safe space. Um, and I think that is a, is a time, um, several times, where I tried to explore my passion, but that fear was something that was kind of prohibiting me from doing so. Very understandable. I, I recognized that my family was just trying to keep me safe. And they, they knew things I did not at that age about engaging in the outdoors as a person of color. I think that's a, a great example and a real contrast with white children whose parents probably say to them all the time, just go outside and play and have a good time, which leads me to ask you a little bit about you do a really wonderful job of kind of connecting environmental issues with racial issues. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you came to that position? I would say my activist journey is one where I was kind of leading a double life. So in one sphere of my activism, I was really invested in environmental protection, environmental preservation. And so that consisted of me leading community science efforts in my hometown. It consisted of me doing some internationally recognized research efforts in climate change and me really grasping all of the opportunities that I had to explore environmental science, technology, engineering, and math opportunities. And kind of in another sphere was my racial equity work. In my high school, I led racial equity work through um, founding a multicultural student union as a safe space for students of color to convene and talk about their lived experiences. I worked with my school board and my superintendent to ensure that racial equity was something that is a part of our school culture. And I don't think I ever let those spheres that I um, had intersect. And that was not until I attended the main environmental change makers gathering when I was 16. This experience really illuminated why it is so important that racial equity work is centered in environmental preservation work and that these issues are super interconnected because I was able to hear from folks, speakers across the United States and the state of Maine about how these issues are really intersected. And I realized that 
my, I don't have to silo myself to this sphere or that sphere, but I could work to make sure that while being an activist myself, I was advancing both of these, both of these issues and um, making sure that solutions are brought about for both of them. And so it was with that, that I really became passionate about environmental education and ensuring that youth of color like myself have the opportunities to not only explore environmental STEM, but also recognize that uh, a lot of the different issues that are connected with their community, they're also connected to the environment as well. And so equipping them with that knowledge will really ensure that they are not the activists or the change makers of tomorrow, but they're the change makers of today. First and foremost, it's, there's a huge disparity in asthma rates of um, particularly Black folks. So Black children are, I think, three times as likely to be hospitalized from asthma. And this is really in effect that when they do have the opportunity to engage in the outdoors, engage in the natural world, that because they live in places where there are incinerators, for, for instance, or other environmentally hazardous sites close to where they live, they're breathing in these toxins, these chemicals. And because of that, they develop asthma and other issues. So in just trying to play outside, do something that is, you know, encouraged for many kids, they are really facing really terrible health concerns. So that is one way that these issues intersect. And I would say another is that just simply that brown and black youth, they don't really have many opportunities to engage in the outdoors because of where they reside, not because not only because of, you know, the health aspects, but also many of the times, you know, black folks and other people of color reside in areas that are more urban. And because of that, there's not many opportunities to engage with green spaces or um, other places where they can get outside. And again, that kind of turns around into health concerns and also a deep fear of the outdoor. So those are two examples that I have of, of this intersect between racial and environmental justice. What continues to motivate you to be an activist? What guides you now? What gives you courage? I think what gives me the most courage, especially as an environmental educator, I have the, like, just, I'm so grateful that I coordinate this network of over 400 plus youth across the state of Maine, the Maine Environmental Change Makers Network. And it's really those youth and hearing their stories and the amazing community action projects that they're leading in their, in their towns and their communities and, and how they're really inspiring so much change. That is really my, my primary motivator in, in this work. It's what gives me courage. It's what gives me a tremendous amount of hope. And because of this, I know that I've, at 20 years old, I'm, I'm positive of what I would want to continue to do um, as, as part of my career in the future. Right now, we have two fellows as part of our Changemakers Network, and um, they're just so, so incredible. One of them is leading a community action project around a water justice conference, Clean Water Rights to Clean Water, a water conference that will be coming up in the spring. And then another one um, in her community is leading a community action project around a beautification project. So like a, a cleanup project. And we have youth that are leading efforts to solarize their communities, solarize their schools. We have youth who have, you know, kind of been in the network and then gone on to be in the legislature. And now they're introducing incredible bills for environmental protection in the main state legislature. So there's just so many incredible youth in the network. And I'm so grateful to work with them. What advice do you have for youth activists? First and foremost, that you have a gift that you can offer to this movement. It is really, really important that you make sure that you recognize that you, everyone has a gift. You have a gift. I have a gift. They have a gift. And I think a lot of the times the fear of not knowing kind of prevents folks from getting involved. So, I mean, I felt like for a long time, I don't really know a lot about the science of climate change. Like, yes, I've taken a lot of classes or rather I've only taken two classes. And I felt like I didn't really, I couldn't really get over that, but there's something I don't know. There's going to be a lot of things that you don't know, because this is a huge issue. This is an existential crisis. But just knowing that this is an issue that you are passionate about, that is enough to get involved. That is more than enough to get involved. And if you are interested in art, 
let's say you you create these like sculptures, um, there's a way that you can fuel that that gift that you have into your activism work. You can create um, maybe models of the climate crisis to better allow other students like yourself to understand what's going on. You might be able to paint a mural. Um, if you're a somebody who sings, maybe you want to organize some kind of like benefit for, for folks. I mean, there's, there's so many different ways that you can get involved. And I would not let this huge, huge issue be something that prevents you or something that makes you feel some kind of fear to get involved because you have something to offer. And at the end of the day, your passion and that gift is really all that matters um, when it comes to being involved in this issue. Thank you so much, Amara. I've really enjoyed talking with you today.